Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Hey, everyone. Say hello. How is everybody? Say hi. Let me know how your day is going, where you're tuning in from. Just say hello. Let's just connect for a moment just as people are joining. How is everybody? Hi, Nicola. Happy, happy Wednesday, everybody. Good to see you all. Nearly 100 of you online already. Fantastic. Hyde Park. Oh, one of my favourite places in the world. Hi, Sophie. Lovely to see you. Hello, Jess. Ah, another lovely place in the world, Dulwich. Yorkshire, gorgeous. North London. Tokyo, Clara. Well, that does sound very, very glamorous indeed. Well, I know who that is in Cambridge. Hello, you. So do say hi. How are you? Hi, Emery. Hi, Rasan. Lots. Hi, Elise. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. Hi, Veronica. So good to see so many people I know, and some I don't yet, but I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to get to know you better and hopefully to share some really great insights with you uh, on Hello Jenny, um, on, on all things interviewing. And um, it's lovely to see some of you um, that I haven't seen for a little while here, which is just so nice. Can you believe that we are about to go into December 2023? Can anyone else believe that? I cannot believe that. This year feels like I blinked in January, Hi, Susanna. Lovely to see you here. Um, hello. Um, yeah, I feel like I blinked in January and it is now November. Uh, does anyone else feel that way? Is that just me? OK, well, we have nearly 150 of us online already. Two minutes passed. So what I'm going to ask you the question, what question I would like to ask you is you are about to invest your lunch break um, with us here. Um, uh, assuming you are in the UK, some of you aren't. But for those of you that are giving up your sacred lunch break or hour in the morning or the afternoon to spend it with me, I want to make sure you get the best possible outcome from this investment in time. So share with me what you hope to learn most or leave with knowing around how to become an advanced interviewer. What is it that you that made you click on that you know, join button today and what do I need to make sure I know that so that I can impart that hopefully if it's an area of my knowledge with you before you leave today just pop it in the chat for me what's most important that you leave today knowing understanding learning having an insight into so that I make sure you get the best possible investment in this time this session is going to be absolutely packed full of hints, tips. Um, the resources we're going to share afterwards are going to be amazing. So implementing professional interview. Yep. OK, so moving away from a vibe and a chat into something more professional. Yeah. Bias. Yep. Okay, becoming best in class. Yep, okay, these are great shares, keep them coming. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so I think, <laughs> um, these are brilliant insights, by the way. Absolutely brilliant. And there may be areas that we need to do a deeper dive into. So when I'm going into organizations and delivering the training on this, which I have done for all sorts of organizations from Lazard to BlackRock to Marathon um, and everything in between, um, all sorts of organizations in between, we normally take two to three hours as a starting point. So we're gonna try and pack as much as I possibly can in to this hour. I'm gonna make sure I leave 10 minutes 
at the end where I'm going to stop showing the presentation. I can answer as many questions as possible and we can continue the conversation afterwards. I think one of the reasons that clients work with us as a um, as a recruitment partner is because this is an area of expertise you would want the recruitment partner that you're working with to have and to be expert in. Now, I am a learning geek. So this is part of one of the areas of psychology, which I studied at university nearly 30 odd years ago, um, that I absolutely am passionate about. I'm passionate about helping our clients to up level their capability to attract the talent that they most need. And I'm absolutely passionate about elevating the candidate experience. And so for both of those areas, what that's meant for me is six years of learning and understanding and growing and training in different uh, theoretical approaches to interviewing and then also doing plenty of my own research too. So who am I? I think I know most of you, um, but my name is Lucy Chamberlain. I am the very proud female founder of an all-female team based in Hoban. There are 24 glorious women there, um, most of whom I've known or worked with for a very long time, delivering incredible recruitment services in PAEA and business support, HR people and talent, as well as investor relations and marketing. So if you're not working with us yet, please think of us because we're really good at what we do. And the relationship is the most important aspect of how we develop trust and deliver our best possible results. And that's underpinned by our transformation and impact, our 12 month aftercare program with our candidates once we place them with you, our ability to deliver best practice, process, procedure, knowledge, whether that's additional insights with psychometrics and we're hopefully very close to B Corp certification, work with all sorts of female pipeline organizations, have a huge project on the side to help women that have had gaps in work due to redundancy or caring responsibilities or any other reason. We've now helped 7,000 women and we coach, fundraise and support the Young Women's Trust. So I think... For me, my biggest driver when I set up the business 10 years ago and with all of the work that we do with our clients, with our candidates, is this piece around unlocking potential. And everything that we do is underpinned by that as one of the lenses through which we make our decisions. I hope that the impact of that has been fantastic for our clients and candidates. We hear that it is. And I'm really excited to share with you some of the aspects that are going to help take you from good to great. Everything I share with you today is based on empirical research, not hearsay. And as a result of that, and I think the research that underpins it is exceptional from all sorts of different sources, whether it's Harvard, whether it's McKinsey, whether it's Cambridge University, and all sorts of other trusted advisors that I would happily base my um, recommendations on. It's going to support you. There are a couple of parts of this presentation that I think you're definitely going to want to take notes, grab your pad, grab a pen. Um, and that's particularly two areas that I want you to focus on when you're interviewing in terms of the question and how to understand whether this person is going to be the person you need them to be in a year's time rather than for now. So many people hire for the immediate need rather than hiring for what that's gonna look like in a year's time. And I'm gonna really help you to use evidence to get people on board that are gonna be delivering and performing in 12 months time, not just in the immediate term. We are going to look at why I strongly believe we need a structure around our interviews rather than the chat, the conversation, the person that you'd go and have a drink with in the pub, the person you used to work with, the person that seems just like you in terms of career and interests, the gut instinct. I met a client last week who, who was struggling with um, the talent that they had in their team and their underperformance. 
And we looked right back at, yes, we were going to help them hire and we were going to bring in a brand new team for them. But we looked back at how the hiring process had worked and what questions were being asked. What was the structure? What were the measurement tools being used? How were they basing those hiring decisions? What tracking did they utilize? And the answer was, I have the most amazing instinct about people. But the evidence was an underperforming team with some toxic cultural elements, some difficult behaviors. And so we agreed that maybe that amazing gut instinct worked once or twice, but certainly wasn't proven and certainly wasn't going to support them building that expert excellence that the team required to deliver at the level the business required. So we want to move away from flipping a coin. We want to move you into a space where you yourself have a surety about your hiring process, a rigor, a standard that you operate to, that as a result of which you can really depend on to deliver the results that you need from the people you're securing. And we know there's still a huge talent shortage, don't we? I also know from our survey of nearly 800 of, client, of our clients that have worked with us over the last four years, that only 8% of line managers, 8% had received any form of interview training. Yet we say, don't we, that our people are the most important aspect of our business. But our behavior doesn't align with that. We need to train our line managers our HR managers, our talent acquisition professionals to interview better in order that we can develop the organization's capability to the level we know it should be at. These are the sorts of questions that I hear clients ask saying to me, you know, these are the questions that I ask and there's no right or wrong. I'm just going to direct you to what I believe will give you better results. But the human brain is hardwired to wreck the interview process because we're driven by ego, emotion and bias. And the ego is the bit that I know best what works here. The bias is the piece around seeing things through our own lens and being comfortable with people that are just like us. And then there's the lack of process. And what we do is we allow people to ingratiate themselves to us. Where do you see yourself? Tell me about yourself. And certain people perform brilliantly with these questions. Then we wonder why six months later they're not performing. Let me share with you some of the stats that I think is going to really help to awaken us to the challenge that we face around hiring the right people for our organizations. We know the impact of a bad hire. One bad hire can have this huge ripple effect, can't it? Culturally, uh, in terms of the bottom line, in terms of who else you're able to attract, in terms of retention, and the list goes on and on. So this piece around the care of this, around the process, and I'm gonna share with you what that should look like in, in my view from my, my research and from what I know works with our clients to hopefully help really shift that for you. 89% of our candidates that we surveyed, and we interview a lot of candidates face-to-face -face for an hour with a behavioral interview, 89% of those candidates said they'd had a poor interview experience in the last year. 56% had been asked an inappropriate interview question. 62% of our clients felt that saying that a candidate was just simply not the right fit was satisfactory. 95% of our candidates says that was unhelpful. And 68% of all of the line managers that we surveyed didn't know what questions they should be asking to secure the right person for their team. 50% of our candidates said that they felt the questions that they were being asked were more appropriate for a chat than an interview. 
changing and shifting the needle, creating a rigor around your process and a standard around your process is going to have the most incredible impact in your organization, in your team, for you personally, in every possible way. We know that when McKinsey undertook one of the biggest research projects around interviewing and the predictive validity around interviewing, that they believe that the difference between a high performing um, organization and a medium performance in organizations was the rigor around the interview and the hiring process. And you can believe it because the knock on effects are just so colossal. When McKinsey looked at this research um, and combined with two of my interviewing heroes, um, Frank Schmidt and John Hunter, what we came out with was a, a predictive validity around how we're selecting our people. And so what we can do to de-risk the hiring process is bring in a selection of the strongest predictors of success in the person that you're hiring a year down the line. So we are Hogan, Assessio and SHL qualified, for example. Um, we also have assessments that we can deliver to candidates. And we, as consultants at CNC, conduct structured, skillful interviews. The vast majority of the companies that we surveyed and these are fantastic businesses, by the way, but that could be even greater. The vast majority, so 72% had unstructured interviews, no work sampling assessments, and no other form of measurement. So if you adopt some of these aspects of rigor around your process, imagine the competitive advantage you're gonna bring into your organization. But not just that, the retention, the health of your um, culture, is going to dramatically improve. So these are the strongest predictor of success. So an assessment center is essentially a blend of structured interview, work sampling assessment. So delivering, and I don't mean sort of something that somebody's never gonna deliver. I've got, uh, you know, I've had experience of working with a client quite recently who was giving the same assessment they were delivering for a senior associate in their investor relations team to a personal assistant and using that as a measure of their capability of delivering. It's not going to give you that level of insight. It's going to give you a limited insight. So the best possible assessment that you can bring in is either to use somebody like ourselves that will deliver that assessment for you or to utilize um, a work-based sample assessment. So what is something that person is gonna to have to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis? Use that and, and create a, an assessment around that. And then the structured interview. So what is a structured interview? Um, now you won't, you won't believe this and I would never name a name because I'm like a vault. 28 years in recruitment means I, you know, that yeah, I, I never share anything out, out, outside of the, the, the room that it's in. But I do have a client that will not interview Scorpios. So if you are a Scorpio, she will not interview you. It has absolutely no reflection whatsoever on someone's capability to be successful. References. It is important to reference. We use we use an external um, third party um, that says everything from adverse social media through to background checks through to references. The reason um, that references are important is only to check that what somebody's put on the CV is actually what they've done. Who are you going to give as a verbal referee? you're going to give someone that's going to give you a great verbal reference. Doesn't mean they don't have a use. As you can see here, McKinsey, Frank Schmidt, John Hunter gave it about a 10% impact on somebody's future success. So again, I encourage you to use a blend. We've seen lots of trends in interviewing in terms of what's considered to be gold standard. We've watched it move from competency Competency was considered to be the most important way to secure the right talent for our businesses. That moved to behavioral. 
That's moving again to performance. But what all three of those theoretical models of how we should structure our questions in the interview, what they all are based on is a structure where candidates are asked the same questions based on job analysis, where we limit our bias and we look for um, a star response to measure the candidate's capability so that when you're asking them a question, you probably all know this on the call, um, that they're looking, we're looking for the situation the candidate found themselves in, the task that they were allocated or took on as a part of that situation, the action that they took as part of the task and the result of that action. And we ask that uniformly to every single person at that first stage. We then ask that same pool of questions to each candidate and we measure the responses. And I'm gonna give you the, I think the perfect structure of the beginning, middle and end of an interview, but the bulk of the interview has this structure attached to it. We can give you um, frameworks of what that looks like. We can give you tons of different questions that you can ask. You just need to reach out to me or we can have a conversation following this session today so that I can explore with you um, how we can be of best service to you in terms of what resources I can share with you because we've got lots. We use a rating scale. This is the biggest game changer in your interview structure. A, it holds your line managers to account. So you have a systematized way of assessing your candidates. We make ours so super simple. It means there is a fairness and a rigor to your interviews that enables the right person to be chosen for the job. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like right now. And remember, you can ask me questions, note them down at the end of the interview, go back over anything that we need to, if we've got time today, or we can carry on the conversation afterwards. Super simple scoring system, but it gives you data to track. What happens after a year of using a scoring system that you then store? So perhaps you have seven key um, performance or behavioral interview questions that everyone's asked at the first stage. Then you have the same five that everyone's asked at second stage. You measure that response, you record the scores and you store the data. And what happens then is you know a year down the line when you reflect on the success of the candidates that you've hired or the individuals you've hired over that year, you then look at their interview scores. And what happens is you can start to develop a benchmark at which you know you have a predictive validity that in a year's time, that person is still likely to be performing at the level at which you want them to perform. And this data piece allows for great decision making and it allows for you as an organization to start to see, to see that if you hire somebody that's scoring sub 18 or you hire someone that's scoring you know, higher than a 20, you know that in a year's time they're going to be delivering, thriving in their work and, um, and creating the business that you and the future for your business that you want to create. It's huge. So numerous studies have found that moving away from an unstructured to a structured rigorous hiring process is going to take you, 90% is the kind of like, I don't know, let's say it's almost like the politician's headline. So it will take you from between a 60 to 90% success rate of that person still performing a year down the line. That's not my research. That comes from this huge McKinsey research project. Whereas unstructured interviews are practically a bit like flipping a coin, about 30% success rate. Such simple changes to our interview and our hiring process can deliver such dramatic results to our organization. So where should we start? And I'm afraid this is the part that most, I might be wrong, 
but I'm going to guess that a lot of you neglect. So the first thing is how, how many of you have taken a look, a proper look at the job description before sending it to your recruiter, your headhunter, you've advertised it. How much rigor do you place on creation of the job description? Because remember, a structured interview, the questions are based on the job description, the job in hand. There's a very good reason for, you, for that that I'm gonna to reveal to you. So, the first thing we need to assess is what are the key performance objectives of this role? So I've put an example here of six or seven key performance objectives for a role that one of, not me, because it's not sort of hiring that we take part of, but a, a colleague in another um, in another uh, uh, area the business was hiring for. So you establish first, when you're reflecting on the job description, what are the key performance objectives in this role? Who has been most successful in this role? What were they delivering? What objectives do we know we need to have in this job description? So it's moving away from a list of duties and looking at the key objectives. Then it's about the skills, the experiences, the competencies, the must-haves, and any training that's critical for the role. Most of us don't look at the primary part of what is most important in the definition of the job and in creating and updating our job descriptions. We rush this piece. We want to get it out there, we want to get the hire done. You think you've got a recruiter that just knows what you need. Make us work for you really effectively. Talk to us if it's us that you're working with, which I hope you are. Um, but what are the key performance objectives of this role? And then look at the rest of it. Um, yeah, Liz, I hear you and hello, Liz. Lovely to see you here. Um, so we need to relook at how we are defining our job descriptions because this is the platform for which we start from in terms of excellence in our hiring process. So I've put some questions here to ask yourselves when you're designing your job description. And even if you are on repeat hiring the same profile of role, I urge you to take some time to look at that job description regularly and ask yourselves these questions in order that the job description you share with us or the brief that you give to me, whether we've worked together for the last 25 years or for the last five months, means that I'm going to work my hardest at delivering the person that's going to be still succeeding a year down the line, not the person that's going to deliver the best interview. So it's asking ourselves critical questions. It's defining the key performance objectives and then everything else and making sure that we're not dusting down a job description that we just pump out, that we have a brilliant and exceptional job description that's going to make sure you set yourselves up for success before defining the interview questions that person's going to be asked. We have a million lenses through which we um, conduct our interviews. It might be that we've just had a row with a partner, an email that's just triggered us. Perhaps I've just had a really difficult board meeting. Perhaps I hired somebody that also loved cricket five years ago. They were terrible. So this person's likely to be terrible. We have to work really hard as human beings because we have bias innately. How do we work hard on that bias in order that we eliminate it? Because we know it creates terrible hiring decisions. All the research tells us that. That's kind of not really up for debate. It makes all of our bias makes for poor hiring decisions, but we can't eliminate it completely because all humans have some level of it. But if we create this rigor around Hi, Veronique. If we create a rigor around our hiring process, we can eliminate it as much as possible. 
What's all the research that's coming out about the Lehman Brothers collapse is that group think contributed to the collapse of that financial institution. We want richly diverse environments. We know they perform better. And one of the ways to ensure that we can attract a richly diverse team, socioeconomically, life experience, education, race, sexuality, neurodiverse, all of the different aspects of what starts to build a rich, creative, intelligent, intuitive team is limiting bias. Now, this is not bias training today, that you would need to attend a whole other training, which I am not qualified in. I understand it, but it's not something I'm qualified in, and I don't ever deliver training if I haven't had expert training myself on how to, to deliver that. So some of the aspects of what we can start to do immediately is by adopting a structured process. Immediately by using a rating scale and predetermining the core part of the interview in terms of the questions will eliminate bias by over 70%. And of course, I would encourage all of us to have regular bias training because it's really important because awareness is everything when it comes to bias. But there's lots of other ways that we can deliver that. And one of them that I really particularly like is to keep the same panel in each interview process. We perform better when we are with a peer, the research tells us as an interviewer. And it means that we behave in a way that is going to deliver the best results for our organizations. Some of the aspects at wit, yes, you use an inclusive language tracker to analyze our JDs and help limit bias. We do exactly the same with our adverts, my adverts, Megan. I wonder whether you'd feel we're going to share one in our resources, but if you'd feel comfortable sharing the ones that you one you use, I think all tools, if we can share best practice, are great to share. Um, but I love the fact that you use that. We we do the same thing internally with our adverts, etc. There's five areas that we should all be looking for. And I'm gonna focus on two that are here that I think we are not as good as we could be at ensuring then um, the best outcome for the person's performance. So we need all of us in all of the people that we bring on board, the ability to accept and implement feedback from bosses, from colleagues, from others, and that is coachability. We all need somebody's a capability to manage and understand and regulate our emotions and to some degree assess others' emotions, depending on the role. We want people that are resourceful. So I focused a lot on accountability and problem solving capability. I've actually now switched this to resourcefulness. I think it's probably one of the most under interviewed for skills there is. Yet it's something we know we all need. The world is, I think we would all agree, geopolitically since 2008 has been like a ever moving, very tempestuous sea. And what we need is people that are able to navigate change, that are able to adapt, that are able to resource well themselves and others around them. So I would switch up accountability and problem solving for resourcefulness. Temperament, obviously we need somebody with the attitude and personality suited to that particular job. Motivation, an intrinsic desire to do the work itself. So many candidates going in to deliver an interview are motivated by the company, inspired by the boss, absolutely drawn to the values and the motivators of the business or motivated by the financial opportunity. These things are important, but actually what we miss in the interview is utilizing strong questions to understand the deep desire to do the work itself. People that leave jobs in the first three, six, nine, 12, 18 months, leave because they didn't have the deep innate desire to do the work itself. They joined for other motivators. 
we need to make sure in our interviews that we are harnessing both. And that in itself will make a colossal difference. And I'm gonna make sure I am keeping to time because we have got so much to get through and I want to give that time for interviews. Don't forget, I'm gonna share loads of resources. We can keep talking and for hiring for you, we can really help support with this part of the process. So we know, Lazo Block, if you want to read his book, it's a fantastic book. It's probably what sparked my deep interest in this particular subject. He wrote a book called Higher, oh, Work Rules. That's what he wrote, Work Rules, brilliant book. Um, uh, he's not at, at Google anymore, but he's widely considered to be one of the best talent acquisition professionals in the world ever. And he set up a lot of their hiring processes. He also unpicked some of theirs. So you might remember, I certainly do, when Google used to ask questions like, how many ping pong balls can you pit, fit in an aeroplane? Uh, how many slices of cake can you cut um, on a cake of a certain size? Those questions have absolutely no validity whatsoever. Um, and he knows that now, but they tried it and they, 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 they really have a very, 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 very good rigorous interviewing and hiring process. So we like people that are attractive in our world, in our own view. We like people that are confident. We like people that smile a lot. We like people that have the same conversational rhythm as us. We are drawn to people that like the same hobbies as us. The problem with all that is, is it, A, it creates an environment where you're hiring the same people, the same people, the same people. And we wonder why we don't have the competitive advantage that we would have from a lovely, rich, diverse pool of thought. But also it wrecks the interview process. And so we don't hire the right people as a result of our confirmation bias because our egos tell us as we walk in, oh, my goodness me, this person loves golf. Holidays where I holiday once a year and happens to have worked at a, a firm I also worked at three years ago. Brilliant. And then we spend the rest of the interview looking to prove ourselves right. Ignoring any kind of rigor or fastidious attention to the questions that we're asking and, and making sure that we're, we're, we're grading those answers. So we want to make sure that we are eliminating that by creating a structured interview. When I'm working with organizations to enhance their capability to hire the right talent, I'm also looking at our behaviors around the interview. Um, you know, it's a bit like every profession. If you if you had a sort of a month with us listening to sometimes what happens in an interview process, you'd probably be quite shocked. Um, even now, uh, it's definitely got better. I mean, 25 years ago versus now is definitely, definitely, definitely got better. But we need to understand that when we walk into an interview as the interviewer, we have an ultimate responsibility to the candidate experience. We have an ultimate responsibility to create a space in which the candidate feels it is a, a space of trust and safety. How do we do that? Well, first of all, I have to make sure before I interview a candidate or somebody for our team at CNC that I've given space before the interview. So when I schedule an interview in my diary, I have space before it and after it to prepare, to check in on the questions I'm asking, to make sure I have our rating scale um, available, to ensure that I have cleared my head of anything else that's been going on so that I can be fully present and allow that person to deliver the best version of themselves. The next step is ensuring that I share with that candidate what is about to happen in this process and what they can expect next. I check in with them. Is that clear? Are you comfortable with that? This is what our process looks like here. This is what you can expect during our interview today. And this is what you can expect after the interview. That allows the candidate to understand that you have a professional rigor around your hiring process. You take this seriously, that you are an employer of choice through behavior over values written on a website. 
And during the interview, you are human. You are going to have moments when the thing you need to buy at Sainsbury's pops in the head, the email you needed to send to Petra pops in, when um, you suddenly notice a fly in the room, whatever it might be. And for goodness sake, if you are online, please don't be looking at emails or be typing out and response. Everyone can tell. So for me, I am absolutely looking to be fully present. And I'm listening. And how do I demonstrate I'm listening? Is I reflect back. Can I understand that what you have just shared means blah? Can I just check in with you that what I've heard is X? I will, mm -hmm. I will make sure I'm nodding, smiling. I will make sure I'm demonstrating I'm fully present. I'll also move people on if I need to. And all you do is very clearly say, thank you so much. And you can use a hand gesture. Thank you so much. I have what I need from that answer. We've got a lot to cover today and I'd like to make sure that we get to every area of the interview. And making sure that you're following a strategic process. We want to get the best out of every interview experience ourselves and for the candidate. What I have learned is every single interview I conduct is also a learning experience for me if I allow it to be. And so we want to make sure when that candidate leaves the interview itself that you have created the best possible experience for them, particularly as we understand neurodivergence more we can understand that creating a safe of safety presence where instruction is clear. Certainly places now like the BBC send out a full um, candidate pack beforehand explaining exactly what their interview process looks like, what to expect, what to prepare for, which is particularly important if you are neurodivergent in being able to deliver then your best. What we also need to ensure is that we give effective feedback. You can be of service to everybody that you meet with, which of course will impact your brand and your brand storytelling and potentially reviews online and so on and so forth. Give proper feedback and you'll be able to do that so much more effectively if you're using a proper process. That candidate deserves that level of service. Please don't give the feedback, not the right fit. And I'll tell you why. And it's not because it's not great feedback, which it isn't, but actually what happens to the candidate sometimes months afterwards when they come away with that feedback is they make it mean something bad about themselves. They start projecting a story of what that actually means. And not the right fit can be a very triggering piece of feedback for lots of people for all sorts of reasons that I'm sure you can appreciate. So give proper feedback, which you'll be able to give much more easily when you are delivering a structured process. So, OK, I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to motor through some of this. So let me let me do so. Um, we'll share the recording. So you can go back and look at this. And as I say, please talk to me afterwards. We can catch up. We can, we can talk about how we can improve your process. So step one, build rapport. Step two, use your, um, go over the previous background. Step three, use your role specific behavioral interview questions. Step four, looking at questions around culture ad. Culture fit is a beer test. Culture ad is about what they're going to bring to your culture that you do not yet have in order to enhance it. We want you to make sure that you are translating the 30% stretch. This is where candidates actually make their decisions. Finances might drive a choice to move companies, but that will also very quickly fall down for a candidate if what's happening in that 30% stretch doesn't resonate with them. So what is my growth potential? What is my learning potential? What is my capability to create impact for the team and the company's goals? Where do I fit into that? Where does this role fit into that? And so often line managers don't necessarily translate the bigger picture and how the role fits into that. 
And if you go back to designing a job description and you have a huddle before you kick off the process, everyone can make sure that they are truly clear. So we want to make sure that we are translating for the candidates that we're interv interviewing a 30% opportunity for growth that's not about money. It's about impact. It's about learning. It's about some form of growth. How are we translating that? What do we know that looks like? How are we making sure we share that on interview? Okay, so we've touched on active listening techniques that I'm going to move through. When you're talking to your line managers, what we need to ensure and everybody involved in the hiring process knows what this looks like. I go into businesses a lot to help them hire in brilliant teams, but also to with their help with their training and development. And very few organizations that I go into can the individual share what the values feel like through action on a day-to-day -day basis. And most can't actually name the values of the business off the top of their head. We need to change that. So we want to make sure that everyone involved in the hiring process knows what the strategy and the goals of the business is, knows how this role fits into that and how it will contribute to the bigger picture, understands the team in the department, knows what that 30% stretch looks like and can contribute to impact, growth and challenge. So there's two questions I'm gonna highlight here. When the resources we're gonna share more, we want to understand in order to attract the best possible performers to our business, a couple of things, a couple of great questions for us all to ask from here on in. The most significant accomplishment that that person has had in their career. So one of you, the best way to do that is to relate it back to one of the key performers, performance indicators that we looked at at the very beginning of this presentation. So we've already established what six or seven of the most key performance objectives of this role is. And now we're going to ask the question. So one of our major key performance uh, objectives of this role is that X. What have you done that's most comparable? So asking and really digging into this question is a brilliant question to start to determine someone's capability to deliver in the role and be motivated to do the work itself. One of the next ones is to look at how this person has achieved in the roles they've had. So A, we know that the best possible performers in their different lines of work will tend to have an achiever pattern. Somebody that demonstrates they have significant potential. Someone that demonstrates that they are intrinsically motivated, that they are coachable. And these are some of the ways that we can start to explore evidence around this person. Have they had recognition? Have they been tasked with special projects? Have they been rehired by a former boss? Have they been given stretch work? Have they sought out coaches and mentors? How are they perceived as a subject matter export? Have they been promoted quickly? Looking at that trend of ever growing performance. Because we want to, and remember, I'm going to send all these resources out. I just need to make sure that we um, that I keep timely today. And um, candidates' reactions matter. Glass door matters. We want your reputation and your legal defense ability to be steadfast. Behavioral and structured interviews limit any possibility of you of your interview process being deemed as unfair or biased. And that's really important. And sharing with your candidate the interview process, proper feedback, using a structured interview process means that the perception of your organization and the brand storytelling outside of the office, in, outside of that interview is going to be exceptional, even if they don't secure the role. And that's what we want. 
So there's this lovely um, hiring formula that creates a strong, consistent result. And that is somebody that has the capability plus the right environment times the motivation gives you the results. So I'm going to just move through this and I want your talent strategy to focus on this. The rigor around the, the job description, what the person will actually be doing, looking at what, how the person is going to become. So how are they going to evolve? Understanding all of that and creating great questions around it is going to deliver great results. So I'm going to leave you with four key recommendations. And then I'm going to invite, so I think we're going to have about 10 minutes worth of questions, capability. Um, so my four recommendations for you are to know that your the two key goals of the interview is to determine, do they possess the right capability and do their values, motives match with what the values and the culture and the goals of the organization are. To focus on hiring for that person to be performing in a year's time over the immediate need. Create a structured interview process. Select questions that are going to deliver the results that you can measure to determine whether that person has the capability and motivation to deliver against those key performance objectives. Standardize the process for all candidates. That eliminates bias, creates an excellence around your and rigor around your hiring that will deliver much better results. Using that rating scale will also enable you to develop data from which you can create a much better level at which you hire or don't hire. So we've covered an awful lot. We're gonna share lots of resources with you. And I would just love to know whether or not you have any burning questions that I can answer in the last few minutes. So do we have any questions? Pop them in the question and answer or in the chat and I will make sure um, that we answer as much as possible. So Claire is saying, how do you um, apply this approach if you only have a limited pool of candidates and you know you're not getting the best person for the role? For me, I would work with better headhunters and I would work with better recruiters. Let them know what your key performance objectives are for the role and let them know what the process is for the interview and let them and let them come back to you with better candidates for the role. Any key recommendations for leading successful video interviews? Well, actually, the structure should be the same, Erin, for whether the video is online or whether it's in person. But we know, don't we, that we lose about 36% of all of our um, cues. So all of the, if you have decent emotional intelligence, you will often pick up on shifts in behavior, body language, energy. And that can often be um, a really good indicator as how somebody feels about certain parts of work. But the rigor and the structure should be the same and the presence is the is the, the it's the power of the presence in video interviews that will make the difference between good and great hiring decisions so making sure you eliminate all distractions that you are fully present and you let the candidate know to be to, to do that too through either a pre-instruction or when you're setting up the interview at the beginning uh, Martin, yes, that's a really good question. Now, I know that there is a, um, a school of thought that believes that sending out the questions before the interview is a good way to create a stronger fairness throughout the interview process, particularly for um, neurodivergent candidates or, or, um, uh, or 
being able to create an experience where people are able to regulate emotion better. Um, and um, and I don't know how I feel about it, if I'm really honest. My, my view is that when you look at the dark triad traits, so Machiavellianism, uh, socio, uh, sociopathy, uh, psychopathy, when you look at those traits, that a lot of those individuals perform are very perform uh, are able to perform better with questions they are likely to know to to be able to prep for. So things like "Tell me about yourself" is one of those questions. And for me, I'm concerned that sending out the interview questions in advance could result in those particular profile of people performing better than others. I don't know. We haven't been we haven't been doing that enough time. We haven't been doing that for enough time to know the outcome yet. So a process that is too long does not mean a process. So a really long process is not a rigorous process. Sometimes what people think is a rigorous process is tons of people involved and loads of stages. Three stages is plenty. One stage is not enough. And utilize what I've shared to have a blend of those assessments or work with people like us that have a blend of those assessments to get the best result. Um, you should not be asking the question, tell me about yourself, because it is brilliant at sparking up. We've looked at PEP scans in our brains. When somebody says, Sophie, when you say to me, tell me about yourself, and I'm great at selling myself. And I share with you, okay, fantastic. I'm this and I've been doing that and I'm great at this and I'm so excited to be here. And Sophie, you think, oh, she's so lovely. She's so warm and confident and she's just the kind of person that would do brilliantly um, at our Christmas lunch next week. And I know she just get on with everyone. Let me get into the interview. And what happens then is you spend the rest of the interview proving yourselves right. It's what happens. Our brain is wired for it. So we want to drop that out basically. Um, so loads of questions coming through. Um, so somebody's asked about a recorded video interview. So I have some clients that do this where we have a, an, uh, where we facilitate that. I do think it's impersonal, but I think as you have just shared that when you have a big pool of candidates, it can be a good way. And it is a structured way because each candidate answers the same questions. The big challenge with um, interview questions, the research that having a video that the research has proven is how attractive we deem somebody to me to be can often skew whether you interview the person or not. So what I would say is use the video interview, make sure everyone's asked the same questions or answers the same questions and use a rating scale against the star response, the situation, the task, the action and the result. So, oh, AI. Um, we don't use any form of AI. Um, we are, I am a, a relation, believer in the relationship and, um, and human contact. So, uh, and, and for that to be the most important aspect, but I know that AI is helping to design interview questions. It's helping to look at job descriptions. It's helping to write job adverts. I am not yet convinced that it's going to enhance our decision-making capability over and above having a rigorous interview process. Okay, right. We are gonna have to draw to a close. I'm gonna reach out to all of you. I'd love to speak to you in more detail. I hope you've taken something away from today that's going to be useful in just 55 minutes. And um, I very much look forward to speaking to you soon. I'll be in touch via email. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I hope you are all very well and that you have had something really supportive and useful from today. And um, we will share the recording uh, with everybody. Take care, one and all. Have a brilliant rest of your Wednesday. I'm here to support you, here to help. Let me know how I can do that. And I look forward to working with you all very soon indeed. Take care. Speak soon. Glad that it's been useful to everybody. Many thanks indeed. Hi, Charlotte. Hi.
seeing so many people I know so well. Hi, Lou. Goodness me, it's been a while. All right, Alicia, take care. Thank you so much. And um, and to everyone else, uh, yeah, take care. Speak soon. Bye-bye.